everybody. So first I would like, uh, sorry, for those who are their first time presentation with us, I would like to take a few moments to share what the wellness means. So cancer wellness means. For those, cancer wellness is defined as a holistic approach that supports the entire person at any stage of the care trajectory, trajectory when living with cancer or when one is a caregiver to someone living with cancer. We want to meet all the needs we are talking about following. Physical needs, informational needs, psycho so psychological and emotional needs, social needs, spiritual needs, practical needs, systemic needs. Research confirms that the necessity to take into account all these psychosocial needs of part of wellness. And by doing this, there is an empirical evidence of the beneficial effects on healing and on the journey. So we are at the West Island Cancer Wellness Center. We offer programs and services that are free of charge. Thanks to our generous donors, volunteers, our own fundraising efforts. We work with a large team of professionals and we are about to enter our 13th year of existence as we continue for work closely with the cancer care offered in hospitals. So this evening will go as follows. We have two special guest members uh, who are working for Cancer and Work. I will just give them a little uh, biography and then we will start. So I have Christine, Dr. Christine Maheu. She's an associate professor at the Ingram School of Nursing at the McGill University and affiliated scientist at the McGill University Health Center Research Institute. Cancer program, Dr. Maheu program of research focuses on cancer survivor issues, return to work, fear of cancer recurrence, managing cancer distress, uncertainty, and coping. Dr. Maheu is the co-director of Cancer and Work and a Canadian bilingual website. Since 2016, Dr. Maheu is a director at large for research for the Canadian Association of Nurses in Oncology, Association Canadienne des Infirmières en Oncologue. Dr. Maheu is also the lead for the prevention and management of chronic diseases platform of the Quebec Nursing Research Intervention Network. We have our second guest speaker, Ms. Maureen Parkinson, is the Provincial Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor at the DC Cancer Agency for over 25 years. She is the co-lead with Dr. Christine Maheu McGill University and content lead for the cancerandwork.ca and created the Cancer and Returning to Work, a practical guide for cancer patients and return to work and job search seminars for cancer survivors. Maureen Parkinson has a master's in counseling psychology, is a Canadian certified rehabilitation counselor and completed the certified return to work coordinator program through the National Institute for Disability Management and Research. Previously, she has worked as vocational rehabilitation counselor for a public rehabilitation hospital, a vocational rehabilitation consult, consultant for a private consulting agency. And as an instructor facilitator teaching job search career exploration for Service Canada funded programs. So please welcome Dr. Maheu and Maureen. So what we're going to do is we're going to first, um, they are going to share the website of Cancer and Work, and then we'll proceed by asking the questions. Thank you, Sandy, for this introduction. Um, Maureen and I are very pleased to be with you tonight. So thank you for having us. Um, so what we'll do in the first 10 minutes is that we'll present what is the Cancer and Work website. Perhaps you are already familiar with the website or you've been on it, and if not, We'll give you a quick run through and then afterwards uh, we will be opening to the different questions that we already um, have for you guys or and also answer your own questions. So as Sandy said, so this is um, it's a website that Maureen and I get gathered together with a team of experts that are present that we created and as you see the cancer work 
um, is divided up into three sections. When you come in, you can self-select as a cancer survivor or a healthcare provider or an employer. And as you will see with one of the slide, um, we have similar uh, kind of table of topics across these sections so that our intent was to make sure that when you do come in, when a healthcare provider and you speak about something you saw on your section in the cancer survivor, that you would have similar topics and, similar, and use similar languages. So I'll show you what those are. So like I said, I'll give you a quick overview of the introduction of the website. Maureen will also give you the important aspect of the 11 steps to return to work, which is our I can work intervention and some discussion or, or we'll show you where on the website you can find information on job search. And so, as we said, so this was the creation. It was launched in 2016. It's, um, it's a bilingual website, 80% about, 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 about 80 of the website is translated. It comes from funding we had received back then from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. But right now afterwards, when the funding finished, it's just me and Maureen, uh, and we've kept our advisory group uh, that are just running the website, making sure the content is continuously updated, and also seeing how we can improve it so that it, you can improve the uh, satisfaction of um, when you're visiting the website. So you'll find over 500 pages of content. Uh, we've created some videos and we're creating some more that are gonna be coming up soon in terms of testimonial experience of others of going back to work following cancer. We have online tools that I'll, I'll present in a different slide and some of our expert writers, I'll let you know who also participated in the writing and the creation of this website. And it was designed for healthcare providers, cancer survivors and employers. And really this is the first Canadian website that really also gives you all the resources and the links out that you can find within Canada. And we did our best always to always put resources and links that uh, were sources sources out that were freely available. And like I said, in English and French, and we were awarded an award for Health Standard Organization for a leading practice um, initiative. So it's a long list, but as I think here, we just wanted to emphasize who participated in the 500 pages and over now of writing, but we had here in the first one, we have psychiatrists that participated. We have um, psychologists as well who participated. We had, um, and Michael Fernstein from the US is one of our specialists who also helped, was the initial developer of a cognitive um, tool and a cognitive assessment tool that uh, Maureen will present. We have people that were social worker up to occupational therapists as well, vocational rehab, um, um, registered dietitian, nurse practitioners as well, Rosemary Cashman. So as you can see, uh, we have a large range of individuals and at the bottom right, you see we even had lawyers who also contributed and we have a nice section on the website, uh, frequently qu frequent questions asked and answers that were answered by uh, uh, legal, by the, these legal individuals. And we also have a, ni a nice advisory group that participated and that included cancer survivors continuously giving feedback on the website. And as you go in the website, once you start visiting, we welcome all feedback. So don't hesitate if there's something you see we can improve, just send it our way. We'll be happy to do that. Um, and so this is what I was referring earlier in terms of that parallel communication and wording. So in the survivors, this is really a bit the table of content that you'll see and the healthcare provider is very similar. The employer is similar, but underdeveloped uh, because now Maureen and I are, you know, we are the co-directors of this website, but we're doing this now on more of on a volunteer basis to keep it on running uh, for you guys, for everybody who needs it. But we certainly have to continually expand this section. And we are working with other organizations such as the Work Wellness Institute who spe specializes in employers and cancer or employers in return to work and we're contributing to see how we can add more content here. But we'll, we'll, we'll see some of these sections for the survivors that um, are in the website that I'm sure will be of interest to you for, for all different reasons. Okay, so jumping in, if you were to start anywhere on the website, I would recommend you start in the return to work, stay at work. And actually, if you see in the bottom of the slide there, and you can see, as I said, it's parallel as, as um, as Christine says, so it's designed so everybody's kind of working through the same tasks at the same time. So, um, and using the same language. So we're all on the same page. Next slide, Christine. 
So within that is 11 step support, uh, 11 step, I can work, 11 step to return to work. So if you just start there and it's everything from starting under, kind of doing the assessment, understanding factors, assessing your function with respect to job demands, asking for help to improve your abilities, how to communicate with the stakeholders, taking control and, and right down to even when you're back to work, kind of how do you make sure that um, your situation is monitored by the physician so if there's any problems bubbled up that they can be addressed. Next slide. So the other section which is kind of interesting is the cancer and impact uh, work on strategies. So what we did was with and was led by Christine and Rosemary Cashman um, which is a nurse practitioner, they sort of identified the 23 most common side effects of, of cancer and treatment. They described them, talked about potential vocational implications, and gave you some self-management options. So some concrete ways that you could work at improving your abilities, and also job accommodations. So we had an occupational therapist that, and I think we'll talk a little more about that, but gave some ideas about how the things at the work site could be tweaked in order to improve your functioning at work. Next slide. So within that, we have the emotional and psychological impact. And these two, this section was written by two psychiatrists, one Alan Bates, our head of our psychiatry program at BC Cancer, and then Dr. Katz, who I think, um, as well as there was input from the others, but sort of led by that. And it sort of zeroes in on the emotional, the psychological impact. And again, identifying a potential implications at work, what can self-management strategies and what can you do to kind of help you at the work site? Okay, next slide. So due to popular demand, you know, I've, this kind of, it's, it kind of started with a, a group that I led years ago, um, or I've been continued to lead, lead since 2012, the Return to Work group. And the most popular talk, topic for cancer survivors is wanting to go back to work without stress and having a better quality of work life. So, so we dedicate a section called Workplace Wellbeing, which is giving you some ideas about how to deal with stress at work. So everything from changing your job, kind of addressing what you're thinking about it. And, and within that, we had a cognitive behavioral therapist, right? Sort of a mini introduction to cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's a type of therapy that's considered one of the most effective psychological techniques to address depression and anxiety as well as things you can be doing, self-management strategies out there to kind of pr improve your resiliency mm -hmm. in terms of work and stress. So ideally the intent of this is so you're gonna go back with a bag of tricks that's gonna help you feel stronger at work. Next slide. So within that we have communication and teamwork. So guiding you in terms of, you know, you've got three big stakeholders here. You've got the workplace, you know, staying in touch with your workplace. So, because you wanna ensure a soft landing when you go back how to disclose, um, that's often a common concern, you know, in a way to sort of maintain your privacy or does it feel safe for you? Communicating also with the insurance provider, a um, great section in there, including links to other resources to tell you a little more about how insurance works. I think in this case, information is power, the more you know. And, and how do you actually, I forgot, how do you communicate with your healthcare team, which is really critical because um, talking to your uh, physician and nurse practitioner in particular is they're, they're basically going to filter you into so supports in order to help you improve your abilities. They're going to be ride, providing a fitness return to work form. So you need to have them informed about your challenges. And also they may be completing your long-term disability form. So they need to know the issues for you. So this kind of prompts you to do a good job to kind of tell them about the challenges and put those concerns on a table and have them addressed. Next slide. Then the other thing is Kirsty mentioned, we got a law policy and practice information. And I'm gonna to refer to this a lot about referring to there. There's a, a section on human rights, just a general sort of overview of it. And as well as we did hire lawyers to answer frequently asked questions. So it's very helpful in terms of, you know, um, can I get fired, that type of thing. As well as we have links to human rights organizations across the country. And I think if you have concerns with that, you want to kind of connect with them in order to ask. And, and even an article about a union, about a union member to talk about how the union can help and cancer survivors return to work. And just a little bit, a bit about workers' compensation. Okay, next slide. So then for some, 
um, some people may choose not to go to work. Some people may find that their job is gone and some they may not be able to go back to the same job. So we created a, a section called changing job and looking for work. And within that, sometimes many people have changes in priority. So they're reevaluating, do I want to stay at the job? And this, that section was written kind of by interviewing our, our counseling department and BC Cancer Agency, asking their thoughts about how to help people work through that. But there's also a section on career job search and, you know, ways to sort of address um, disclosure in a new job and, you know, how do you handle gaps in your resume? Career exploration for some of you is a great little links to resources that can help you kind of go through a career exploration process and even something about should I stop working or retire if you have that option to retire, you know, looking at the pros and cons of that. Next slide. And then, as I mentioned, the occupational therapist gave some ideas about, you know, for very common side effects of cancer and treatment, things you could do in the, at the workplace in order to help you kind of improve your workability and allow you to return to work successfully. Next slide. So, Christine. Okay, so these are, uh, this is on the Cancer and Work website, you'll find a tab that's called Interactive Tools. And under there, these are some of the tools that we've generated or produced for the, uh, for the website. So we have the Cancer and Work Job Analysis, and we have one um, copy that's for directly for the survivors, another one for the employers. And really this is to help you with the healthcare providers as well to assess in terms of the temperament of the job, the requirement of the job, to seeing what is it that, in order to get a, this analysis of what is your job, like a very good job description, if especially useful if one is not available from your employer. And then that starts to help you to see where you might uh, have um, the need for some accommodation. And then we have the Cancer Work Return to Work Planner for employers, but also can be used for survivors. And this one, um, again, fits well with the I Can Work 11 steps that Maureen was just presenting, but this is certainly one that you can use as a tool. Um, and I'm going through this quickly, but you can ha have a chance to go, go back and look at them. But again, this is the Energizer Drainer tool, and that's to help you identify, you know, what are the sor some sort of activities at work that actually could give you some energy versus drain you, and then trying to see where can you fit this balance in terms of when doing it. And then there's the, what Maureen already presented this one, how do you, you know, how do you um, do some... Um, thought restructuring so that you don't see your, your workplace as stressful as you, you feel that it is. So how do you create those helpful thoughts? And then there's the fatigue tracking tool. And again, this one, this is to assess the fatigue level during different times during the day. And again, to help you assess when you might need some rest. And that works well with the Energizer Drainer. And then the task analysis goes with the job analysis and it's similar where actually we're combining these two in terms of analyzing what's essential and non-essential at your work. And the cognitive symptoms at work checklist, Maureen already uh, mentioned it. It's a pretty good one in terms of assessing where you might be experiencing some different cognitive challenges and the frequency and the intensity. And this is a great tool to complete and also to share afterwards with your healthcare provider. So these are just some of the slides. Um, so going into a little more details, Christy mentioned this is the cancer work job analysis. And this is a way, you know, particularly the first 15 pages to literally go in and, and very helpful in terms of talking to your doctor and putting your cards on the table about your challenges. But you go through it, you click, it asks you everything from your weight requirement of the job, your assessment of your ability, and the good news about this is, and it's asking about your physical abilities, your temperaments, the psychological and cognitive demands and the environmental conditions. And the good news about this is it allows you to summarize it. And then um, you tick on whether you can do it um, partially able, is it required of the job? And we're working on even making it better so it's more streamlined, but it's a great little tool to summarize and hand to your doctor or your insurance provider and saying, these are the challenges I have. What are we going to do about it? But it also kind of tells you, these are the strengths I have. And this is good because these give you some ideas about this is where maybe your job uh, could be tweaked a bit, um, or maybe some of the uh, job duties could be changed a bit to highlight some of your strengths. Next slide. Christine? 
You're talking so, about. so this is the fatigue tracking tool that um, I was mentioning. So in this one, you, it's set up that you can assess it over a five day period. So let's say a, a working week. And then you can assess your 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 fatigue level at the start of the day, at the middle and the end. And once you complete that, and it's sometimes better when you sit visually in order to get a better sense of one of those times during the day that you're most fatigued. And once you've completed it and you hit submit, it gives you a tracking. So just a second, we're live. That's my dog you're hearing. Luca? Okay, why don't you go next slide, Christine, and I'll... Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of similar, also related to, to, to fatigue tracking tool. This is the Energizer Drainer. So this is an opportunity for you to go out, as because Christy muzzles her dog, um, in order to, um, to kind of see when I do these activities, what brings me, gives me energy and what drains me. Because these might be the things that you're going to do in your workplace. So for example, if you find concentrating on a task is really going to be really tiring for you, you sort of trying this out at home, like, maybe going for a quick walk or having a glass of water, are these the things that bring you back? And these could be the things that could be put in a workplace. And I'm the classic queen of this now that I'm an old lady. I can say this now that I have an, I have a nap. I have a big easy chair in my office. And I have that because I find that in order to make it through the afternoon, I have my power snooze. So I've learned that in terms of assessing my energy. And, and, um, and the, again, the reason why we're recommending these tools is um, you know, definitely I'm thinking about a lawyer that spoke to our doctor is rather than saying I've got tired, it's really good to say, like using the fatigue tracking tool, this is, this is the impact of my fatigue mm -hmm. for everybody to see that. And I always think about somebody who applied for benefits and he talked about, for example, he had headaches and he didn't get Canada pension plan, but if he'd done a tracking tool that showed the intensity, how often it happened, things like that. And had, had, had used that when he applied for Canada Pension Plan, he might have got the benefits. So again, this is it's taking out of a, a vague description into something that everybody can really concretely use. Next slide. So this is the cognitive, we didn't actually mention it here. This was a tool that was developed by Dr. Bernstein. And it's, it's um, they did a study and they showed that this, these, um, they ask you these things in your self-identicate report of cognitive challenges uh, related to work-related tasks was as good as a neuropsych assessment in terms of identifying challenges for those who are back at work. It hasn't been looked at as, a, as in anticipation of it. But the, hand, the handy thing about this again is you fill it out, it gives you descriptions of the functional problems you're having with cognition. And you fill it out and you give a summary to your healthcare provider, your insurance provider, and you say, what, uh, these are the challenges we're going to have. What are we going to do about it? And again, this is going to help them assess your readiness. But hopefully, most importantly, what it's going to do is it's going to help you get the help you need in order to the rehabilitation support, particularly often like occupational therapy, in order to help you successfully give you the support to be able to go back to work. Next slide. That's you, Christine. So this is the, again, this is the return to work planner that accompanies well the 11 step I can work approach that we have on the website. And it's, it takes you through that. It takes you through each of these steps, such as um, writing down in paper. But this again is something that you would uh, either do with your, um, your employer or you could do with your healthcare provider in terms of identifying when you think would be an anticipated start date and end date for needing for your um, return to work, when that would be completed. What are your essential tasks and duties? And that goes a little bit again to identifying those essential tasks with job analysis that we mentioned earlier. And then with those, once you do have um, essential tasks that you have identified that you might need accommodation, you can click here that gives you specific ideas for each of these accommodation that, might, that you might need. Let's say if you're experiencing cognitive challenges, what are possible um, accommodation? And then it would give you a chance to write it up here. And then in terms of uh, based on these accommodation, which of those tasks you listed earlier that are required accommodation, you could write them here. And then once you've completed these, um, these steps, these 11 steps, then actually on the tool itself, there's six areas. You click print and then you get the printout of what you put in. So really what the intent of this is, is to kind of input the information from your healthcare team, problem solve with your employer about accountability, set up sort of 
a return to work plan, but also set up regular meetings. So, mm -hmm. so with your employer, in order to make sure that, you know, if you're having challenges that they're addressed, of not sort of waiting for you to totally fall apart, but regular meetings and decide who's, who's um, responsible for that. So, so that you can address these things um, instead of it getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And in one of the last steps, which is important, it will ask you, you know, at what rate is the follow-up that you review in terms of what you can, still can do and do you still need revisions on your return to work plan? Because it might, you might realize once back at work that this, this return to work plan needs to be modified for something else that maybe like Maureen, you need to put in a rest period, an additional rest period in order, in order to be functional for the rest of the day. Yeah, and so what this is, is we're realizing we're seeing this in the research. And also certainly from my experiences, some people, you know, I think return to work in many cases is, a, that's why I encourage people to say return to work trial is the best guess that you're going to go back, but sometimes it needs to be changed. And so that's the whole point of having regular meetings. And what we're finding is some people may be back to full hours, but they still need those meetings to problem solve the challenges, even though you're back to full hours. And sort of mm -hmm. so the hint in there is we're saying at least once or twice, um, you should be in follow-up and even more depending on your needs, even if you're back to full-time hours that you're, you're assessing this and we shouldn't assume we need to, the, the employer and you need to check in together to make sure you're, you're not struggling unnecessarily. Okay. So we, I think we took a little, little time. Mm -hmm. So now we're into questions, Sandy, sorry about that. It always takes longer, but I hope we answer a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can, um, so maybe Sandy, if you want to pick the Yes. Next. Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting. Yes, you have. There's certain questions that you answered uh, that I was going to ask, but, you know, your website, which is nice and interesting that you showed it because it is well detailed um, in steps to do that. Because, you know, when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, returning to work can be extremely exciting, but to some people it can bring extra anxiety and knowing that they have certain limitations um, so definitely on the website, which I had noticed that, yes, you have those 11 steps of getting ready to return to work. Christine, could you go find that and we can show it? So go ahead. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll reshare the screen, uh, Sandy. So definitely, have, go ahead. yes. And, uh, and everybody is definitely different. So, you know, the impact and mm -hmm. the assessment functions, the ability to function will all be different. So it's very interesting, all those steps. When a person goes on your website and sees these certain steps and they have, you know, because sometimes people were not all savvy, you know, on computers and that, is there a chat where they can ask questions and that can help them to go through that or? So we're working on it. Um, Christine, okay. maybe you want to thank you. So we're, we're, we're working. So that was one of the aspects, as, you, as we kind of shared, now the cancer work is more volunteer-based, and we still have an advisory group, but we're working, that we're keeping it alive for all of you guys. Okay, so we okay. did, we did, we're able to get some small funding where to incorporate testimonial videos and navigation videos also that will describe what's on the website. And now as this place, we started incorporating a chat box but it's still it's still um how do you say um Progress. under construction yes. <laughs> so yes. we're working with our it person we we hired somebody and we had some fun to do this a chat box where you write in a question in terms of a return to work plan and then it will help guide which um which section of the website to go to okay okay so at this point yeah go ahead sammy in the process can they call uh your we it's have an email. They can, they can, they can contact okay. us. We have an email. They can send us an email and then we can okay. further direct them if they can find the place. Because we they have a specific demand that they would like information on, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So and unfortunately, have, can I say, wait, unfortunately wait, wait. we're not funded to do individual answers, okay. but we will direct you to the website. We just aren't. Unfortunately, we'd like to be in a perfect world. We'd like to be able to have vocational, like somebody such as myself, that there is... Mm -hmm continuously providing support, but we're not funded. I'm hired by the BC Cancer Agency to serve cancer patients from British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And I do individual support like that. So at this point, we will certainly direct you to the part of the website that answers your question. Like eventually we would love it if, if um, how Canada would want to fund the website and then fund individuals that we could hire so that they can provide individual counseling. But other than that, 
in the meantime, there's either either the survivor, if they want to see where can they obtain additional services, we have under links to services and resources, let's say employment and vocational rehab program. If they click into this, if they're taken to either what's available federally or by provinces. Um, that it we, also shows, if you go a little further up, a little, if you go a little further up, you see the cancer specific specialist too. So like in British, British Columbia, it's actually, it's a little further up. It should be, where is it? The, where we're talking about wellspring and stuff. Where is it gone? Can you click on the first page? Yeah, right there. See right there is a list of, you were there. Yeah, just before. So right there, the top bar, you have a list of the of vocational rehab programs that, that we're aware of across Canada that you can that are in your region. And then okay. you can click down a little more. And, and if you're aware of any any of them, we want to know about it so we can feature them so that that you know where, where other people know where to go. The only criteria is it has to be freely available. We are, we're not going to promote somebody's business. We don't no. And we want it freely available. And under contact us, we we just finished creating a, pa um, a pamphlet that really summarizes what is a website. We created this with patient partners as well. So um, it's a two page um, pamphlet and it gives you an overview of what's on the website. So you can okay. look at it and say, okay, I'm interested in this. It's under return to work. So you can go back on the website and get that. And okay, these can right. be printed off. some ideas for navigation. Okay. So a question would be, because I, I have participants definitely, you know, that they go through their treatments, they have their cancer, they're diagnosed, they go through their treatments. And sometimes not knowing it comes quite quickly and they're finished their treatments and their doctor give them a prescription saying you can go back to work in the next few months. And that's quite fast. So to prepare, you know, is there, I know the steps to get ready to work and definitely this is a process that they can concentrate after their treatments because again, you already takes a lot of attention uh, during their treatments. What would be um, an example for factors that it can impact the person for their work? Well, there's, there's a lot of factors and you know, that's part of the early on in the assessment stage and hopefully the, by the doctor saying in a few months, I think you're ready, hopefully they've been addressed. But they're everything from biopsychological, which is basically the physical, the psychological sort of um, proceeding, um, you know, things that you had before, the things that are a result of your cancer treatment, that, you know, how long are there residual impact? Like, are they lasting a little longer and they impact you? There's also the person related. So sometimes what we see uh, from people is they, they might feel differently about work and that's where change of priorities comes in and that can sort of affect your, your thoughts about work. Um, there's also the, um, oh God, I'm a system. So again, part of that is even access within the system to support, to help you improve your abilities. Um, also, you know, how timely, and I think in one example, you know, somebody who's waiting for breast cancer reconstruction, what may affect whether they decide to, they may decide, oh, I'm going to wait until after my, re my reconstruction surgery because to go back and then go off again is too disruptive, you know, for my employer. And so these are the things to think about. That's a systems issue, a medical system. And mm -hmm. then there's the workplace factors. There's the things like, you know, what supports exist for you at the work? Are they ready for you to provide you a job? You know, um, how are they feeling about you coming back to work? How are you, um, you know, what are the job demands do you think? So these are all the things you kind of want to look at in order to assess your readiness. And again, that sort of comes earlier. One would hope by the time if the doctor's saying two, two, you're two months away, I would say, uh, Christine, can you go back to the steps and I'll show you. So one step, if you're getting a little closer to return to work is to take the prepare for your return to work, step nine. So that one is where you're getting a little closer. You, what can you do to improve your conditioning? So, and that can also like starting to do a work simulation if it's safe. And, and, and again, you know, that can come closer to the time, but it's also a form of assessment for, for you to sort of still, you know, to see again with your doctor's permission is, you know, if you're doing um, a job that's slightly physical, maybe you're gonna start doing light housekeeping, you're gonna clean your place and you're gonna try and build up your capacity. Yes. So you're not, you're not gonna go back in sort of like cold and deconditioned or you're gonna ask for services that may condition you. Um, similarly with this, you might be, um, 
figuring out with your with your family and taking into account commuting, starting to sort of think about, okay, I got to commute again. I got to get up early again. The advantage of doing work simulation in terms of getting up early is we need to sort out whether sleep's going to be an issue for you. We want to get you into sleep routine because better to do that, address that while you're not at work and have that addressed than wait for you to go back. And that's part of, you know, the challenges for you. So if you're finding a sleep is an issue, that's something else that you've been putting on your table. And I think it's also really important to be talking to your, your family and saying, you know, things are going to change for me and mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to be available to you as much as that. And I need you to help out because I'm going to be tired. And so we need to have a little discussion about how we're going to redistribute the, um, the household tasks, that type of thing. Well, that really highlights that you prepare yourself, but you also prepare the people around you that you will be going back to work soon and things, the, the, the routine at home will change and they'll have to adapt and support the person as well. Yeah. Mm. If I want to add, when you have somebody that's not ready to go back to work, but the doctor keeps saying, you know, so I notice, I guess the tools that you mentioned, you have the track fatigue tools, you have the cancer and work interactive tools. I guess these are great tools to complete, to show your doctor also that you've done an assessment uh, because I've had, you know, examples where the guy, you're fine, you can go back. And they're like, no, I have this and that. No, 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 okay, correct, you can go back. So I find that very interesting, those tools that they have, which they can help and give that to um, the employer and their doctors if the doctor's pushing too much, exactly. And not yeah, well. absolutely, Sandy. It's a way to sort of articulate what are we going to do better. And I think the backup can always be two things is absolutely saying, so for example, cognitive and the doctor will say, oh, I think you're fine. Well, I think you, you want to say, I, even in your, in the report, kind of say, well, can you say I'm self-reporting cognitive challenges, but you're giving them the tools because at least it's put, put on sort of record. But I also think, you know, you, a lot of doctors, and I think it's, it's a, it's a, there's the pros and cons. Doctors are wanting to get you back to work because for most part, work is healthy for you. Yes. And unnecessary time off work makes it harder to go back. In some cases, you might be losing, just dealing with it today, your job might change on you or, you know, or you get rusty and all those things. So they're trying to get you back. And in some cases, a graduated return to work, for example, is rehab in itself. But, you know, you can say, okay, if you think you're ready, you could be, if you have insurance, you can be saying, can you ask for an occupational therapist to support me on the job? So if things go sideways, I have a fallback. And, you know, the advantage of that is in some ways, in some ways, this is an opinion here. And, the, and an occupational therapist, for example, is actually going to assess you. They're going to actually see you in action. And that's going to be way more relevant than, you know, a doctor that thinks you're okay because they're not seeing you in action. But absolutely, these self-report tools are critical. And, you know, just an FYI, we had a lawyer come and speak to our doctors on this. They're helpful things for even the physicians to quote when they're talking to insurance companies saying, according to the cognitive activities checklist at work, this person has this, this, and this challenge. And he said that's it's another legal tool. It can be used as a bit of a legal tool that can okay. support your case. Okay. When you don't have the support from your employer and you have to get uh, some help as an employer where you have to go to your union and to notify that, you know, you, you, the demands of your job, uh, you're unable to anymore. And definitely like a big example, brain fog, you know, so you can't concentrate as much. So those tools that you have would be great and to find out exactly the support that they would have at work. Because sometimes, you know, you have to go through your employer, your, your boss, but will the boss, if not interesting to give you more feedback and you have to navigate yourself. I'm sure in certain companies, some don't have, some have unions, some have uh, support. Yeah, and sometimes unions don't always support return to work as well, and it's up to the union. I think it's really, and sometimes employers don't even have the expertise in order to know how to support you. That's why, you know, if you have something like OT available through insurance, getting that, because that's the expertise. Employers don't know how to support mm -hmm. you. And I also like kind of having a doctor recommend if it's available, because unfortunately, um, I know in British Columbia, we don't have that readily available in the, pro in the public system, but they do it. But that's boots on the ground. Somebody who's, who's kind of saying, yes, this person needs this. And I think we can provide this in your work environment. Mm 
that type of thing. But one of the best things you can also do is to try these things out yourselves before you go out back. So that's back to, you know, looking at the, um, can the job accommodation ideas and trying them at home. And just FYI, from a human rights point of view, the employer has a duty to accommodate your restrictions and limitations. It's up to them how do they accommodate you. But I think you can certainly say, you know, if I, and I did this myself, if I have an, if I have an easy chair in my office and I take a nap, I'm going to be more productive and less cranky. And, and so, and, and so you're making the case for them. And so, you know, I think this is how we could work this out. So it, it doesn't hurt to try these things out and float them and, and, and sort of turn them as, and it's absolutely true. Like, you know, if I have this, I'm more productive. And those assessment tools can help also that if ever they need to change jobs, they cannot do the job that they did before, but can be assessed and have a job, another job in that company. So with that assessment tool, that could help them do that to get a, well, it certainly can give them an idea of the challenges and maybe the job accommodation ideas. And that's where maybe the job analysis is really helpful because it's saying, this is what I can do. This is what I can't do. Yeah. This is what I'm partially able to do and maybe give some guidance on that. And as Christine mentioned, you know, being getting clarification from the employer, what's the bottom line duty, mm -hmm. essential duty of the job. So there may be lots of duties that you have in your job that could be given away that you can't do. And kind of that's where doing a job demand, doing the job demand analysis is doing or getting that from your employer, because you're really trying to get a sense of their expectation. What yeah. it, and, you know, one of the steps is just to float out to them how, how, how much they're willing to accommodate you. And I think that step um, on one of the I can work steps uh, is, you know, assessing the supports of the workplace. How have they accommodated people in the past? What have they been willing to do? Okay. And even floating it and saying, you know, I'm struggling here, you know, and kind of seeing that ahead of time and reporting to your back to your doctor because you may, you know, they say, no, no can do, or, you know, all or nothing. Sometimes, unfortunately, employers say that. Well, that's good for your doctor to know that they're not going to be open to a graduate mm -hmm. return to work. On the other hand, you may be surprised. A lot of employers, uh, how they can, they know their duty to accommodate. And, and you know, um, sometimes absolutely they're willing to help you out. So, oh, sorry. I send you, I'm seeing there's uh, like a few people online. I'm wondering if they have like either specific questions for us. I, I do. And that's what I'm going actually to oh. one of the questions. Okay, go, go so for it, Sandy. When you're evaluated like that and you've noticed that you cannot do the job anymore. So then you notice that you can't get another job at your work. And then you're realizing that, you know, maybe it, now it's time for me to take my pension if I'm eligible for my pension, um, if there's a penalty. So, and sometimes to complete the forms for the pension uh, disability, again, I guess these assessment tools that you would have, you would be able to help because sometimes it takes a lot of process steps to explain, get another prescription from your doctor stating now you really cannot work uh, back to work. So, um, so those assessments also would be good to help uh, the pension um, yeah, to prove your pension. And I think also one of the things you could do is say if you're seeing a physiotherapist, have your physiotherapist write a summary. So in yeah. some ways you want the doctor that knows the whole you, that that knows like, you know, you may find oncologists have, but you know, they forget that you've had arthritis previously or, yeah. or you're struggling with this over here. And so yeah. you, you want to have a doctor that, especially for things like Canada Pension Plan, that knows the whole you, because in many, psychological is a big example. You'll have, you'll have oncologists, they'll say, oh, from a, from a chemotherapy point of view, you're just fine. But psychologically, you know, you, and that is part of the picture, because there could be many people that are off or, or need to get pension for psychological reasons. And so that may be that that has to, those, a psychiatry report needs to go to your family doctor, whoever's filling out that form, so they can see the holistic you and, and provide a, 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 an opinion. And that's the intent of this is for you to basically, it's terrible to have to do it, but, you know, this is for you to take control of this, pop, this situation and make sure everybody knows everything that's going on for you so that you're going to get the support you need. I have another question, uh, and, and I know that you've mentioned that this site is translated in French, 80% of it, so I'm assuming, because I know there's a question about uh, retirement, uh, la retraite, uh, donc, 
tout serait traduit en français pour les détails exactement quoi faire. Euh, yeah, I'm not, yeah. Le bonheur. Yeah. I know some of the tools, most of the tools are not translated in French yet. So we are working right now with a group that may provide some funding. So we're looking for funds to finish translating the tools. Okay. But the tools are not um, translated. And I, but I think that part about should I retire is translated. Okay, perfect, perfect. Another uh, just an FYI, I should have returned. We just referred to a Global Mail article. There's a great little retirement calculator that exists in Service Canada. Yes. yes this and, one yeah, here. and it's really cool. But it, it tells you to also things about, you know, sometimes I think in the early stage of recovery from cancer and things like that, people can be, oh, I never want to work again. But, you know, as you start to feel, or I can't imagine ever working again. And as you start to feel better, you might start changing your mind. So, so, you know, this is sort of to have you think about, you know, like, how are you going to feel if mm -hmm. you're with your time and, you know, how are you going to have meaning in your life, that type of thing. So, so and I think then, that's, it, that's why it's good to speak with your healthcare providers to find, especially to do the follow up care to start realizing, yes, you are experiencing a lot of cancer related fatigue and chemo brain fog, but to learn that for most individuals over time, these get better. So it's not something that will be permanent. For okay. some, it remains permanent. But what if for you, it's just that, you know, you just need this additional three months or six months. And during that time, in order not to lose your job, or like Maureen said, sometimes going back to work, it's part of the rehab. It gives you some, even some re, like you know, ways to function better. Then what can you do at work temporarily to accommodate while you're still adjusting to a new you, a new health, uh, health level that could be similar or a bit different than pre-cancer? Okay. But it's that ongoing communication and, and best not to do alone. And, and we do say this is something, it's a team. And this is why that communication is teamwork. And that's where we're emphasizing about this one, where the return to work is communication and teamwork that it's done with your healthcare providers and your team and as well at your workplace. So to get them ready for you to return as well. And so that okay. they understand that visibly, perhaps there's nothing left. Your hair is growing back. You look good. You look healthy. But, um, you know, there's other aspects that you still need time to uh, recuperate. Okay. Because that's one of the big questions sometimes. People are anxious uh, because they're not sure what they're going to say to their colleagues. Mm -hmm. And what we do have a nice section on that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when Sandy, are you saying about whether they're going to come back or not? Is that what you're thinking? They're going to come back and then they're saying, oh, I just don't want to deal with all these people. Or, you know, sometimes I encourage them. Have you spoken to any of your colleagues since have you left work? You know, do you have communications with them? And then yeah. slowly, you know, if not, maybe slowly the closest colleagues that they have, then, you know, and I, and I do refer them to your website yeah. of certain things. Um, definitely. Uh, so helping them to talk to their colleagues yes and we, we have a section about disclosure and I think it's, it's I know a lot of people kind of especially when when they're in treatment they just don't want to be bothered because especially if your colleagues are complaining about work you have enough stress in your life already and so that they can have mixed feelings or they don't want to feel pressured the yeah. flip side of it is you want to create a soft landing for yourself and that includes your colleagues so staying in contact with them, saying, gee, guys, I miss you. And, you know, maybe even saying things like, you know, let's, I'd rather I'm really stressed right now. I, I can't hear about work, but I just wanted to say to you, I miss you. And I'm really looking forward to you coming back. You know, this is the one thing. The reason why you do that is you want friends at the workplace. And we've seen that because when you don't have that, it can just be harder. You also don't want somebody to get attached to your position you know, quite strategically. And that's the same with thing with your employer. You're going to say, and you know, you decide whether you can do this, but whether it's okay for you, but you might be ambivalent by going back to work, but you don't want to make it psychologically easy for them to give your job away. So you kind of say, you know, it's really important that I have a job to come back, you know, pull out the psychological warfare there. You want to make sure that you have some choices when you're ready to return. Okay. I know that our time is getting limited and I wanted to speak to two more things, but uh, Christine, peut-être tu pourrais répondre à la question. Il y a une question qui est demandée en, François, en français. C'est quoi possible impact sur le plan de retraite? C'est quoi quoi? C'est quoi possible impact sur le plan de retraite? C'est quoi possible impact? Oui, impact. Y a-t-il une possibilité que la retraite est impacted? 
I'm, moi, je comprends bien. C'est que si ah. tu prends ta retraite, peut-être trop de bonheur. Oui, ça, ce n'est pas, pas un domaine que je m'y connais. Maureen, peut-être pour apprendre un peu plus, mais c'est savoir, encore là, il faut que tu ailles voir avec un finance. On en a un patient qui, euh, qui va, nous, nous, va nous présenter une vidéo qui avait regardé justement, est-ce que je peux afforder, est-ce que je peux me permettre de prendre ma retraite à ce moment? Puis il avait été voir un conseiller financier, savoir justement avec les lois du Québec, est-ce que je prends ma retraite avant l'âge de 65 ans? C'est quoi le pourcentage que je perds? C'est-tu 30 c'est-tu 40 okay. Puis c'est seulement qu'à 65. Fait que, on a des liens sur le site web, puis qu'il faudrait je bois en français si on l'a euh, pour à des ressources pour aller chercher un conseiller financier, mais c'est vraiment comme Emploi Québec, un organisme d'emploi Québec qui pourrait fournir de l'information à savoir c'est quoi la, le niveau de pourcentage de perte par année quand tu n'as pas atteint ton 65 ans. Parfait. Mm. OK. Une autre grosse question. Another big question would be definitely, uh, as you know, cancer can become a chronic uh, illness. And is learning to live with this chronic uh, cancer. And a lot of people, uh, definitely even stage four metastatic, will return to work, yeah. will return to have a normal life. And But they continue to have certain treatments. They continue to have side effects. But just the idea, and I, and I, I guess in your um, website, it helps, I guess, those steps to communicate with the employee why it's so essential for you Um, to continue to have these treatments um, for you because sometimes it's difficult. You have to take half a day, another day. I don't know if there's something that you can say about that. Well, you know, and I, I think that's why you want to keep the, 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 the dialogue going because I think when somebody is living with cancer and is having ongoing treatment, you know, one opens you get a bit of a pattern, but some stuff is unpredictable. Yeah. You know, I think having... A good relationship with your employer, looking at contingencies, looking at, you know, again, COVID, if there's a plus side of COVID is employers are now a little more open to people working from home that, you know, years gone by, they didn't. And now they're open to that. So, you know, problem solving around how to make up the time if that's expected or looking at, you know, you know, the more you can be open and have these conversations so the employer can get the job done, sort of think, and maybe that's looking at reducing your time. So I think it's really important to have that. I did, I did work with somebody and the employer is very resistant to come back. And we did, uh, we were almost threatening human rights with him. And, and then we just, and they wanted an inordinate amount of information about him. But then the end of the day, we said, look, he can come back, but this is what he needs. Like he needs the power snooze at lunch. And he, you know, we got to cap the overtime and that type of thing. And, And he's come back and it's successful. And that, and really and, yeah, and in those in, in those instances where you can emphasize is that you know by for the by the employer making these efforts of accommodation, you get a loyal person who in, in return will be very loyal to the company and appreciative for all these accommodations. And so you'll get somebody you know um, might take a few more hours extra to get the work done, but it will get the work done. There'll be this connection or um, uh, feeling of. Um, Of gratitude back because uh, the employee is doing his best as well to accommodate. So that's a case um, that the person can put forward. Actually, if, if we put a case for employers, I encourage cancer survivors to employ, to refer the employer to the employer section because we start with the business case to why um, employers should support mm -hmm. cancer survivors. Okay. So it isn't only that it's not only loyalty, but it's also, it's other people seeing loyalty. This is about good seven principles to support return to work. So it's like, it's showing yeah. others that this is a good place to work. There's the business case. Yeah. yeah. Some people ask, you know, can they be fired because they have cancer? Well, not supposed to be. So kind of typically, no. But, um, and uh, what I'd like to sort of point out is that if you have any concerns about this, we've linked to a human rights organization that you have a discussion. Um, no, you can't be discriminated based on cancer, which is a disability. Um, limits could be though, but there's a bit of a loophole with, um, with human rights, which is, it might be more likely they don't have a job available to you. Um, uh, and that is the undue hardship clause, which is a very high bar for employers to reach. But so when in doubt or when in concerned, I'd call human, look at our legal answers, but I'd also say, also call your local human rights where we have that under the, I think it is under the law policy 
and we have your local yeah legal re resources and human rights and call them but typically no you can get laid off but again you can't be picked on you can't be isolated because you have cancer but if others are getting laid off and unfortunately this is what we saw with covid yeah yeah, yeah they were doing layoffs and they're doing layoffs of everybody and having cancer doesn't protect you That's exactly yeah. yeah definitely okay Oh, I think we did very well. It's eight o'clock. Oh, wow. Debbie, do we have any other questions, actually? I think that showing the website, uh, I didn't ask all my questions, uh, definitely because in your website, it details it so well. Uh, if they're looking for something, they click on it. It will be in detail exactly uh, the steps, how to prepare yourself. Um, and again... And there's the search button that's working nicely. So they can use that one instead of the, um, while well, we're working on the chat box, but. Okay. Yeah, so, and, and this is a very nice paper, how, the exercise of disclosing. So the pros and cons, should I disclose to my employer and your, uh, your employer and to your colleagues? And um, gives you the pros and cons of discussing it. Okay. Comme je demandais, yeah. Parce que c'est certain, you know, what the employer can ask, what can you share and all that. So, parfait. A lot of those... I think we did the job search, but the frequently asked, asked questions on law policy talks about job search. Yeah, under law policy, legal question, answer to frequently asked question is a very nice section as well. Okay. Puis yeah, j'ai bien à regarder... Uh, and your website, you know, when you have to speak to your colleagues, actually it's well detailed there exactly how to express and how to talk and that. So very good website. Very. Thank you. I, I don't have this, we don't have this website, but you can always say to your colleagues, a lot of people are afraid about when they come in and they ask you and you kind of don't want to be bothered with this. You can always say to them, thanks for asking. You want to acknowledge they checked in with you. Do you mind if we don't talk about it? I want to put it behind me. So it's a nice way of saying you, you, again, we want them to be supportive of you saying, I really appreciate you checking in with me. Come, and they'll probably be relieved that you don't want to talk about it. So, but it's a way if you don't want to go there. That's good. That's good. All right. So no, we don't have any other questions. So uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting, very informative. Thank um, you for the invite. Exactly. And great. Yes, Larry, thank you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so, which I share uh, fluently, uh, oh, frequently, actually, I should say with the participants. So, and actually now I know that actually, uh, you know, I, I seem to wait when the participant comes to ask me questions because they're about to go to, to work. And now I, part of my work is I'm going to stimulate them and encourage them to look at it even before. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because of all the tools and that. So thank you very much. And sometimes they need to be their own um, uh, defender in terms of bringing up the topic to their healthcare provider and saying, I think you need to look at this website so you'll know in advance how we need to assess my readiness for return to work and how do we do this. And yeah. just a, a bit of a plug, we are going to be releasing a course for family care, family care providers. It'll be out at the end of the summer. So wow. if we want to help your doctor help how cancer survivors do a better job. We're gonna, all they have to do is look on the website okay. under the events section, but we're gonna have a physician course okay. available to them. Yeah, you can, you can tell them to take the course. It'll be freely available to them. But this is to train uh, physicians to be um, better, to, to better guide uh, cancer survivors with the return to work process. Okay, interesting. Great. Well, thank you very Thanks, much, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for attending this workshop. Very, very interesting. Very Thank nice you. to meet you all. Thank okay. you. Take Thank care, you. everybody. There we go. I think slowly, uh, that's great. Not, I've learned not. actually quite a bit more of your website, so. Yeah. Well, like I said, there's over 500 pages, and we're still adding more. Um, but, um, yeah, so this is now done on the side of our desk, but we believe in this aspect and we take to heart people's work and, and their cancer experience that we just want to continue doing this. If it means, even if it's the extra work. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's great. Yeah. Oh, welcome. I think Maureen already left. <laughs> yeah, Maureen left already. Okay. All right. Oh, she, she was heading Everybody, out. Everybody's I, gone. <laughs> I know she had to head out. Um, she, she was meeting somebody. This is after work for her. She had a hot date. 
No, she was going for swimming in Vancouver. You know what? They're, they're swimmers. She was going for swimming and then was going out with a friend afterwards. Oh, that's <laughs> so nice. that's we're nice. going to start the rumor that she was having, a, that she's gone to a hot date. Oh, sure. She'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank enough. you very much, guys. That was great. Thank you very much, Christine. Very, very interesting. I even so, yeah, that. right now we have, um, you know, something, I don't know if you guys can help us. So we're doing testimonial videos and I presented at the um, at l'Association des Infirmières en Oncologie two weeks ago to their conference. And we had one patient who ex described his experience where he returned to work, had to pull back and then, because he went into burnout and depression and then tried again a second time and that's when he discovered the website and started using um, some of the assessment or asking for the assessment and get ready but all to say is that we're working with a company who's doing this professionally so we we have somebody who's done it in French one in English but they would like to do it also one-to-one face-to-face but we would need to find somebody from Vancouver because the company's is, is um, located in Vancouver a cancer survivor who'd be willing to be videotaped where he would just have to go on the website and see where parts would have been helpful had he known or had she known and, and then describe their own experience, um, whatever it was on returning to work. Returning to work, okay. All right. So Maureen doesn't have any contacts in Vancouver? Well, because she, um, the e-course is a quality improvement project and so she cannot directly ask pa her own patient. So she cannot- mm -hmm. Political. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, with us, uh, you know, having across Canada uh, virtually, so I probably will get to meet a little bit more people, and maybe it will happen. Uh, if I do, definitely, uh, as I said. Somebody from Vancouver, yeah. yeah I cool. always refer them to your website, so um, definitely, for sure, yeah. Okay. Parfait. Oh, but merveilleux. And anytime, guys, I look forward, like, I, like, I, I do some studies with the MUHC, but I'm always open to um, work with you guys and then, um, you know, do studies, whatever, fever, we can do another fever current. So we finish our group fever currents. The paper we're trying to publish, oh my God, four times they've asked us for modifications. So we're still working on it. It's been a year and a half and it's finished. But um, I know there's gonna be an interesting uh, project with the MUHC, the transition project. They're working with the endometrial and prostate cancer group where they're after three years, they're slowly transitioning them to the community, they say the community. So you might get some of these uh, patients who go refer back now or let go of the MUHC and are just followed up uh, by their family physician. And then for those who have issues with return to work, they'll be referred to the cancer work site. If we get the funding from CHR, then they can do the intervention where we'll hire an OT. Uh, the, so the idea is if it's on site to get an OT to do a work assessment, otherwise she'll have to do it verbally by interview. And the vocational rehab with like Maureen will do three sessions to see where do they need assessment. So she'll be like a nurse navigator and referring to those assessments so that they can better prepare for return to work. So if we have the fund, then these people will get that, um, that intervention. And um, the FCR intervention, I'm working with the psychologist there to see if we can do it together. But, um, Just you know, we're, really, we're looking now in the, because we've done the RCT and showing that it works, we're looking for real world settings to um, try out the group uh, intervention for fear of, fear of cancer recurrence. Okay. And that eventually, usually this is done by um, a nurse and a social worker or a nurse and a psychologist. Um, but if the nurse has advanced training in mental health, then it can be done with two nurses. Okay. So I, I could be one of those nurses, but my training is more from within the, uh, within the intervention itself, but not an advanced mental health or a mental health certificate. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you so much. I'm sure you must be really hungry now. Well, I had a bit of soup prior because I went out running and then I was hungry. <sighs> oh. So no, I'm just tired. It was a long day because we had um I I am I am one of my doctoral de defense my my student was defending or well beginning to defend her proposal, looking at the the, um, the impact of exercise to improve. Um, quality of life of lymphoma, young adults, lymphoma, uh, cancer survivors. So she's going to be looking into that. So I'm wearing my Fitbit because we're trying out how the database can, the data can be downloaded into a database that's Salad the Jewish. But we're looking to see, and this is with a kinesiologist. So 
Can a Fitbit and a kinesiologist be enough of a motivator to get them to exercise to the recommended level, the national recommended level of 30 minutes, three times a week, but up to five weeks, five times a week idly? Okay. So we're going to be starting that study. Wow. Nice. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you again. Very interesting. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us. And we always like, uh, you know, meeting uh, cancer survivors from everywhere. So it was a pleasure to see them on, on the Zoom. Thank you. Good night.